The novel The Songwriter by Paul McCann. Chapter 4 Common Ground When you're flying above the ground in a jet, everything can be imaginary. Up there, you could be anything you wanted to be. I thought of myself like a transit soul leaving this world and becoming a resident of the unknown. In this bright new world where our clouds are like the foundation of the future mansions in a place where heavenly territories are rewards in a timeless place, sanctuary, in a land where you can have dreams that can float as easy as a thought running through in a land where your own dreams can float like as easy as a thought into your mind. Then I came back to reality with a heart and a mind in conflict. All I wanted to do was to, is to be with Linda miles away. The distance seemed distant. Love is like an anchor or a bait or like a ball on a chain hanging on to emotions. My heart was light and my head was a buzz. My emotions were high as this plane that flew in the sky. I found it hard to relax. I had no real desire to sleep. Apart from the menu and directions on how to put together a life jacket, there was nothing really interesting to read. I had listened to almost each of the selection of songs on the music channels. Outside the window of the jumbo jet, it was dark, and I tried to imagine an alien creature out there sitting on the wing of the plane looking in at us. Then I thought about the situation of being hijacked and I thought about the engine on fire. And before long I was asking the waitress for a drink and it wasn't long before that that my prayers inside began to frantically be offered up. I hoped to God it was easier to be heard near headquarters. I looked at the faces around me but most of them were fast asleep and time seemed to go so slow. We had been in the air about 12 hours and I began to compose my thoughts. As soon as inspiration came, so did the want to go to sleep. But with a melody in my head and a new song in the way, I didn't want to sleep. A heaviness came upon me. Now I was tired, but over the years I had always found that when I was half asleep or drowsy, it was at that very moment when I wrote my best lyrics. Spurred on by that thought, I took out a pen and my notepad and started to write down some lyrics. Suddenly, far below, the lights of a country sparkled into view. The plane was descending and before long, I had the title of my song, Jewels of the East. I thought as the plane gradually came to land and made its way along the runway, that it was being pulled in to be refueled and it was to be there where we could sit for a while and relax and some passengers could clean themselves up and then they could make their way to the transit lounge. And But as we did, all of my thoughts became distrangled. Standing there were soldiers with guns and rifles everywhere. There were lots of strange people drifting through the duty-free shop and at the bar there were armed military at the Arab Emirates, very much different to what I had imagined. I stood there in the presence of this and it wasn't a nice experience, I'll tell you. I had thoughts about Belfast again creeping into my head, memories again resurrecting from the past into my conscious mind. I tried not to think of someone pulling out a submachine gun in the transit lounge and starting a gun battle. I looked at the faces and began to suspect everyone as a possible gunman or terrorist and I looked at the ways of getting out of there and not being a target and I hoped somebody innocent would not get killed or caught up in the crossfire. That really hit hard. I remember where I was. All I wanted to do was get back on the aircraft. I made my way to the public phone and with a few tokens in my pocket I purchased from the armed guards. I made a frantic phone call from the public phone box to Linda in London. The phone rang and Linda's voice answered. Hello, is it? Who is it? Hi, Linda. It's me. It's Paul. 
Guess where I'm calling you from? Who? It's Paul. I'm ringing you from Arab Emirates. It won't be long until I'm in London. It was just at that moment, you know, when the announcement came over to board the plane. I said a quick goodbye to Linda and made my way through the screen of armed soldiers uh, into the bus that had brought us back to the aircraft. We all sat there in the plane for some time waiting for the, the seat belt sign to come on, but it never did. After a long wait, the captain announced that we had a passenger gone missing and that we would have to wait until he was found. An hour passed with us, sitting there on board the plane, not moving. It was mentioned by the captain that a large crowd of people were now hunting for this lost person. Finally, they had discovered the lost man who had fallen asleep in the cubicle in the toilets. Well, I must tell you, he got the warmest reception when he came back on board. Every one of us stood up and clapped and cheered. He was so apologetic as he came running onto the plane. As soon as he took his seat, we were again on our way. The jets roared and the plane soared up into the sky. Hearing Linda's voice had only made me feel all the more in limbo. I found my heart beating a bit stronger than my head. and My mind and my body was heavy and it soon came to me that I was falling into a state of blurred semi-conscious hallucinogenic images that were only there for a brief romantic thought and a spur second of time. I fell asleep with the pen in my hand. Gently awoke by the air hostess on the plane and the morning was creeping through the small window beside me. The plane wafted through the soft white clouds and the air hostess began to hand out breakfast entrees. Good morning, sir. Catching up on your letters, are you? She said with a smile. I rubbed my eyes and wondered what to say to her. Then it came to me. I thought, now's your chance to introduce yourself as a writer oh, and a poet. Smiling back at her, I said, well, I'm um, actually catching up on some letters. is a bit like running after dreams a little, don't you think? Will anyone ever get to the end of it and discover the place where reality is only an illusion? Do you remember Henry Lawson? He was an Australian poet. Well, he once advised any Australian writer who wanted recognition to leave Australia. Do you think he had a point? The air hostess looked at me with a puzzled expression and thought before she answered my question. Uh, I I travel a lot and um, I don't have much time to write. I wish I did though. Good luck with your dreams. She put down the tray before me and left. I could see she was a little bit spellbound by what I had said. I hoped that maybe her life would change for the better. I wished that she had more time to write and find more thoughts and dreams. I gave a moment in silent prayer before tackling breakfast. I enjoyed breakfast. It was delicious. Straight after reading, I went into the gents' toilet and freshened up. I checked the time and realised soon we would be coming into Heathrow Airport. My heart was burning as I thought about Linda. The pilot spoke softly through the aircraft's public address system, announcing that we would be soon be landing in London. Walking back to my seat, I met the air hostess who said, I hope you make it with your riding. I thanked her and took my seat. It wasn't long before we had fasten our seat belts. As I put my seat belt on I thought about the bondage that I had with writing and I realised then and there that this compulsion to write had totally invaded my life. The plane circled around for ten minutes above the misty grey city of London. When it was all clear to make a safe approach we touched down at Heathrow Airport. I watched and waited and the passengers all started to leave the aircraft. They poured themselves out from the plane and I sat for a moment looking at the empty seats, feeling unsure about what was to come and a great sense of being alone hit me hard. Here was I, 10,000 miles from my family and a lifestyle that I had adapted myself to. Australia had grown on me. I had walked from the plane, a nobody in this place. 
Strangers passed me by with suitcases in their hands and I thought to myself, I wonder if they have heard of heaven and I wonder if they know where they're going with their excess baggage and their very important jobs. Outside the window, I could see the day had a typical overcast look about it. Soon, I would have to face a cold morning and there on the streets of London, I had to cheer myself up. I dreamt about making a name for myself and held that thought for a while. Maybe I could become a somebody. My fantasy was interrupted with a sudden halt as the escalator suddenly stopped. Some malfunction in the system had broken down and the moving walkway was not moving anymore. So along with hundreds of other people, I had to journey and carry the baggage along the corridor to the customs area at the checkout. And the journey to the collection area was long and tiresome. Each step I took would seem to be a long, drawn-out process. When I arrived at the end of the walkway, I found the spot where all of the baggage came down. The conveyor belt was overloaded with all kinds of bags and boxes and all kinds of people standing there waiting for their personal belongings to show up. I noticed a young lady there She looked tired, and it was difficult for her to lift her two heavy bags from the conveyor to the hand trolley, so she was having some trouble. And as her two small children started to mock up on her, she seemed perplexed, and she took off her pink anorak and threw it over her shoulder. Her grey sweater was loose and long in comparison with her tight-fitting blue jeans. Her white canvas shoes looked trendy but a little bit out of season for this time of year. It was obvious she was not going to manage her bags and her kids all at the same time, so I went to give her a helping hand. I smiled and I said, here, let me help you, love. But before I could grab her suitcase, I felt two hands on my shoulders and I was pulled to one side by two plain-clothed men who produced identification cards and photos. They began to fire questions at me. Where are you going? What is your name? Where have you come from? I was in shock. I stood there feeling like a social outcast. They refused to believe I was an Australian. My Belfast accent was still very thick and as time went on, I could see that there was a problem. In a second or two, I was escorted away by these two security men and taken to a small room in the airport and interrogated for hours. And then my baggage was brought in through the room and everything was pulled out and gone through. I gave a number of contact people in Australia for them to ring. The security checked out every one of them. At the end of the ordeal, I was given an apology and allowed to continue my journey. My arrival in London was a cold, hard awakening to reality. I walked out from Heathrow Airport in a daze and began to realise the harassment I went through was because of my Belfast accent. They must have suspected that I was a terrorist on the run. Terrorist? My goodness, do they have to suspect everyone from Belfast to be a terrorist? I travelled from place to place and I understood how I could have probably been mistaken for one. After all, I did have a Belfast accent and no one accompanying me. Although I was convinced myself the security were the only people there doing a job and I felt hurt and angry at what had happened. I was not a member of the IRA. I had never fired a gun. I had never thrown a brick or harmed anybody in my life. The fact that I had become a victim, a suspect, a man hated and unwanted made me see the terrible injustice of it all. The smile had again left my face. I withdrew myself into a deep silence where I felt protected from insult and further harassment. Still shaken by the experience at Heathrow Airport, I walked with no idea of where I was going. All I wanted to do was to get away from the airport to some quiet place to collect my thoughts. After walking for hours, I discovered that London is not a quiet place and that there are very few spots available to find space to think. Like a train with no brakes, I was hurting, hurtling and heading along this footpath with my belongings in a suitcase. 
and desperation written all over my face. I knew I had landed, and that was about the length and the breadth of it. I had no idea or any clue at all of where to go or what to do next. Eventually I got into a black taxi and asked the driver to bring me to Kingsland Road, Dalston, East London. I was intrigued by the sidewalks where the row after row of black garbage bags lay in the hope of somebody picking them up. There were so many unfamiliar shops and council flats. The driver asked me twice where I had to go. I then remembered the name Queensbridge Flats, but he never had heard of it, so I told him to drop me off anywhere soon. As I got out of the taxi, I paid the driver and stood looking around me. More litter was piled up high on both sides of the road. A number of huge constructions surrounded me. Somewhere in this concrete jungle was Linda's flat. I stood there, as the song says, lost in a lost world, but reminded myself that I had come so far already and that the last stage of this journey would have to be child's play. I found a phone and contacted Linda who gave me the exact directions on how to find her flat. It wasn't long before I stood there waiting for the lift to bring me to the floor at Rowan Place. Like an innocent child I knocked on her door. I could hardly wait to see the expression on her face when she and I had eyes on each other again. The door opened and she said, What are you doing here? I felt my world collapse instantly from under my feet. I was lost for words. I scrambled for something to say. I scrambled and words refused to unfold. There was something in the way. Nothing came out. Ah, oh, you better come in, she said. I made my way inside her flat and sat down. Linda looked very upset and she said, You can't stay here. <laughs> my boyfriend's coming here soon. Didn't you say we were going to get married? I said to her. She looked at me with a hard face and said, This is the end of the line for you. Oh my God, I thought to myself. Apart from being humiliated and from being unwanted, I was probably at that moment the loneliest man in the world. Sure enough, a knock did come to the door and in came Steve, Linda's boyfriend. Immediately he began to roll himself a joint of hash and as he lit it up, another knock came to the door. In walked John, who was boarding with Linda. John was a London taxi driver and my first impression on him was that he was a dangerous man. Linda put Chris Ray record on and turned up the volume. It was like a nightmare as I watched Linda and Steve kiss each other and giggle in between clouds of white smoke that drifted up my nose. They seemed to have forgot about me sitting there on the couch. Another knock came to the door and in walked six young lads with happy faces. They went straight into the front bedroom. Linda went in after them and I never saw her again until the next morning. I had fallen asleep on the couch. Her cat was curled up at my feet and stretched and climbed over my legs. It was quiet and I realised all the company from the night before had left. Linda walked past me into the kitchen and without a good morning or hello she started slamming doors in the kitchen cupboards one after the other and she began to scream at me. I'm going off to work this morning and I don't want to see you when I get home. After a bowl of cereal, she had a shower, and it wasn't long before that that she emerged dressed for work in her black leather jacket and pants. The front door was closed after her, and I sat staring at the walls in her flat. I must have remained that way for hours. During the time she was at work, I began to write some lyrics of a song that was entitled Lying on the Lounge. It was the first words I had written since arriving in London. I was jolted by the sound of a key at the door and Linda returned into the flat. She was furious that I was still there. I sort of felt that I wasn't welcome. I tried not to think of myself as an unwanted dog in a flea house. I tried not to think of murder in the first second of her third degree. And I even tried not to think of this as another one of those moments when the ground would open up to swallow you and spit you out in disgust. All I could do was leave with my dignity. 
I stood up and looked at her in the eyes. Without uttering a single word, I then grabbed my bags and left. Without saying a word, she slammed the door of her unit behind me. I almost fell into the lift and made my way from level 13 to the ground floor. Dazed and confused, as the song says, I could not work it out. Nothing seemed to gel. I thought of myself being afflicted with this terminal illness and longed for death to come. But the longer the ordeal went, the further I had to go. And like a leper, I walked into a place called Wellingborough in North Hans. Now, I had a sanctuary far from the rocky jungle of London. At last, I had sight of some common ground. An oasis in a wilderness, a light in a tunnel, a song in the making. I walked into a fish and chip shop and sat down at a table by the window and chewed over things with a hot cup of soup and asked some friendly people for information on how to catch a train to North Hans. After many inquiries, I was told by a Negro who worked for the London Underground system that I could get a train from St Pancras railway station that would take me to Wellingborough. So immediately I headed for St Pancras. I walked with my suitcase in hand and on the way collected thoughts that ran like running water up a sewer. My emotions were throwing my heart upside down and inside out. My nerves were floating on a steel vessel on a stormy sea. Every thought I had ever had of Linda had been capsized. Like a man on a deserted island, I wandered along wearing a disguise of security and strength. God, give me strength, I thought to myself. My cash flow was starting to dry up, and I knew things had to get better, as they couldn't get any worse. I got off at Wellingborough and looked up my aunts in the phone directory. They lived in a place called Killinway, and I caught a taxi that brought me to their front door. When I got out of the taxi, another taxi pulled up right in front of me. I could hardly believe it was my Aunt Mary and Rita getting out of the car, and they held two plastic bags of groceries in their arms. Hello, Aunt Mary. Hello, Aunt Rita. (laughs) It's me, Paul, your nephew from Australia. They ran over to me with their arms outstretched. Oh, my God, what are you doing here? They were almost in a state of shock. Well, I just came to say hello, I said. Come on in, son, you must be exhausted. I followed them up three flights of stairs and then through the front door of the flat. It was warm inside and welcoming. Aunt Mary rang Aunt Katie while Aunt Rita put the kettle on. In the said half an hour I was watered and fed and the flat was buzzing with people. My Aunt Katie arrived with some of the cousins. Everyone was so surprised to see me. That evening a crowd of us went out to the local workers club. I was introduced to all my aunt's friends and was treated just like one of the family and one of the local people. And after a few drinks, I had a few dances, gave a pool and then I started to open up to my aunties. Told them about Linda and my experience in London. All my relatives were upset about what had happened and they tried to cheer me up with some funny stories about how things had gone since leaving Belfast and them in England. I felt secure at last to have touched some common ground. I was welcome in the company of all my relations and their close friends. There was invitations every day to go out to see the sights around North Hans and beyond. And from a game of bingo with my aunties in Wellingborough I went to the nightclubs and discos with my cousins. I enjoyed weekend bets on the football pools and the horse racing and at some of the local pubs I placed pool balls in pockets and I caught up with the latest songs on the jukebox. I started to feel as if I could settle down here for a while. The only thing that made me reconsider hanging up around this place was my creative songwriting style that I was used to in my life. I had been so busy doing things that I had never had time to write. I remembered the air hostess on the flight to London and hoped she found time in her life where she could write. The trauma deepened as I was restricted back to normality. Somewhere in my mind I imagined I was being held prisoner by a thug who was never going to set me free. The thug threw me into the deep keep of a building and took some hard chains and wrapped around me and it was up to me to make a break for it. Locked within my subconscious mind, there were so many things I wanted to say. I had scribbled them down on bits of paper and filled them into places in suitcases and pockets and for a later date to be finished. 
my biggest headache now was the money thing because I had very little left to play with. Maybe people around me had the thought that I was loaded coming from Australia, but if only they knew half of it and how badly off that I was, I'm sure they would have been as concerned as I was. I never told anyone I was almost broke and I'd hoped that I would strike some luck maybe on the horses or the one-armed bandits but as yet I found it hard to crack the English form at all. It seemed that all my relations had adopted a comfortable English lifestyle. They were accepted by most of the community around them and there was never any bitterness or resentment towards the Irish people that endured over the centuries in England. The troubles in Belfast were still making headlines in the newspapers and on the TV and although you felt distant from the troubles you could never afford to be complacent. We all remained aware of this place we call home. There was very little work now in Northern Ireland because of the violence and the thousands of people who were forced to leave their home and cross the water to find work. My cousin Brian and his sons, Michael, and John often went over to work on construction sites in the Isle of Dogs around London. A long list of my cousins and I all had steady jobs in England. Johnny was earning good money bricklaying and Tommy operated a crane. Jim had a great engineering job. Everyone told me there were jobs galore in London, so I decided it was time for me to go and look for work. I had just enough ready cash to buy a bus ticket to London, and with a task to make or break off I went, with a suitcase and a guitar in my hand. As I left the common ground that I had come to know and love, something that I was used to, into another wilderness that awaited me, and a picture that I had set my foot and focus in with the unknown future and the hard facts of being lonely and hungry. I couldn't give up hope that my talent and my songs would make it. On the long, hard road, I thought for a while about songwriters like myself, also on a long, hard road, who had the same dreams that I had had. And so I kept saying to myself, all the suffering must be worth something. It has to be worth it in the end. I was jolted back to reality by the loud chimes that rang out from all the saints church tower and in the town centre the church bells began to ring out the sounds of Christmas as I checked my bus ticket for London. Bus up, up after bus arrived but still there was no sign of the National Express. I waited and waited as the snow fell and people passed by with both arms full of shopping bags, parcels and carry outs for Christmas. Suddenly, the bus rolled up and I got on. The driver seemed to be glad not to have no one on the bus and to have some company there. There was no other people on board but myself. I showed the driver my ticket and took the seat up by the window and as we headed out to Wellingborough, I watched the countryside roll by. Now and then, a small shop or a petrol station would appear and then disappear and the bus driver would make some comment. Schedule stop without anyone getting on. Eventually another passenger got on. She was a West Indian girl and looked at as if she had lost her mind or she had something troubling her. No sooner was she on and she was off again. Three stops and she was gone. The snow again had turned into sleet and for the first moment they changed the rain just as the angry night began to fall. I placed my head into my hand and slid into a half sleep trying to get some kind of relaxation. My eyes stared through the misty window and I wondered about how cold the streets of London would be. The National Express picked up speed and we headed along the expressway. From the distance I could see the little street lights in the villages that I would never visit and there thought about the people inside those houses and what they would be having for breakfast and there were signs and bright lights as we passed large towns and I felt like I was locked in some kind of spaceship in a twilight zone. I had absolutely nothing in common with anything or anyone that I saw. And I was awoke by the screaming of the bus driver. Come on, we're in London, off you get. I picked up my suitcase and a six-string guitar and I stumbled off the busy 
Victoria Street Station completely lost standing there and thought what was I going to do and where could I go I made my way to a phone and rang the only person that I knew in London hello Linda it's Paul how are things fine is everything all right Paul she said I was quite taken back as if it sounded as if she was concerned things could be better I thought maybe things are okay what are you in some trouble no no just looking for work couldn't believe I was actually talking to the same person. The tone between us was warm and, and the thought passed through my mind that she and Steve had broken up. I'd tested out the waters. So how are things with Steve and yourself? Great. Although I don't see him now these days. He's busy with his job. Hi hey Paul, do you remember the taxi driver guy who was staying with me? You mean the quiet fellow with the thick moustache? Yeah, well he's been arrested and charged with bashing up one of his customers. He also owes me for a week's rent. The first time I saw him, I got the gut feeling that he was a troublemaker, Linda. You're lucky he was arrested. So tell me, have you got a new lodger yet? I put an advertisement in the Evening Star, so I hope I get a response soon. In an unguarded moment with no place to stay and the night on its way, I felt helpless, as I said to myself before her, like a lamb to the slaughter. Well, what would you say if I wanted to move in? Well, why don't you come over and we'll have a chat? Okay, how would I get to your place from Victoria Street? Oh, well, you know, get get on the tube and get off at the Angel Islington. Then uh, that station will bring you down to Kingston Road. Once you see the um, Dalston Post Office, get off there and you'll see the Tower Block Flats. Right then, okay. So that was the Angel Islington, you said? Yeah, the Angel Islington. It's like a double word. If you get lost, ask somebody, you know, I ring me. Once you get to Liverpool Street Station, you're almost here. Okay then, I'll see you later. Yeah, bye. Take care, yeah? There's absolutely no idea where to go. I walked along the streets of London. The rain fell and soaked me like to the skin. Somehow I managed to find myself at the underground by St Paul's where I bought a ticket to the Angel Islington. End of chapter 4